said, the Bible tells us here in Matthew 28, if you look at the Word of God, it begins in verse 1, at the end of the Sabbath day, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. On that very first Easter morning, as the dawn was breaking on a world that was forever changed, the angel of the Lord and the risen Son of God, as we continue in this passage in just a moment, delivered a special message, a message that still impacts us today. And may God help us to take it into our hearts as we consider the fact that he was not in that grave anymore. He had paid sin's penalty. He had taken the price that was required for all men, for all time, forever, for all sin that could ever be committed. And it settled the score, settled the payment with Almighty God. Jesus had accomplished that opportunity accomplished that mission and the tomb was empty. God approved of what Jesus did on the cross. He raised Jesus from the dead. Amen. Thank God for it. But imagine the, the, the impact in the disciples' lives as they considered what was before them as these ladies gathered themselves to the tomb at this point in, the, in, at this point in time as they began in the, in the hours of the dawn to go there in the first day of the week. They went there, number one, with a great deal of anguish and anxiety. A great deal of anguish and anxiety. They'd spent the last three and a half years following a, an unbelievable man, the, the, the God-man, Jesus Christ himself, who turned the water into wine, who healed the sick, who raised the dead, who had power over the tempestuous waves, and yet he succumbed, it seemingly so succumbed, to all the punishment of the cross and gave up the ghost there. Now that phrase is an important phrase. I want you to know that no one took Christ's life from him. He willingly laid down his life for us. He laid his body on that cross as they drove the nails into his hands and into his feet. He willingly went to the cross for the joy that was set before him as the penman, the human penman, had the Holy, the Holy Spirit had the human penman write in the book of Hebrews. He went there for the joy that was set before him. Why? Because he knew he was going there to pay the price for you and me. He was going to make real the words that say in God's word, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He embodied those words in that moment. He went there for the joy that was set before him. As people, as people understood that and they believed that and followed that, they could not be fathom that the Roman government could even take his life from him. And they were in great anguish. Amen. Great anguish. Likely we've all experienced the loss of a loved one and the grief that it brings. I, I mentioned a moment ago that I happened to be at a beautiful memorial service early yesterday morning. First opportunity I've ever had to experience something like that. It was a little earlier than I had imagined it, it might be. <laughs> but I was so glad that I was there and just had a small part in helping people to sing when we all get to heaven. I had my little guitar out there standing on the shore there. The sun came up. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Amen. We could sing with hope as we thought about Miss Judy Horn's life because we knew she had accepted Christ as her Savior and we, we knew that there was no finality in her death on this earth. That's a fact, but death doesn't feel that way, does it? Death feels like the end. They, and these ladies, as they came to the tomb there in Matthew 28 on the, the first day of the week in the dawn hours, they went there with the, all the grief and all the shock, all the anguish that you and I could ever experience in losing an earthly loved one, as we like to express it, and losing them. And we don't really lose those who go to be with the Lord, but we have a separation that causes great anguish for a while, don't we? They went there with all that anguish, all that grief. Uh, their hopes had been shattered as Jesus bled and died on the cross. It was a difficult journey as they went back to the tomb. Fear and dread was filling their hearts as this little band of ladies made their way through the dark streets of Jerusalem on a Sunday morning. They were going there to, a, to the tomb of a man they believed to be the Messiah for whom they'd left everything in this world to follow. They were going there confused. They were going there confounded. They were going there because they were drawn there. They were drawn there. I believe they were drawn there. Grief draws you to the graveside, doesn't it? I think of my own life as I think about my parents that are with Jesus. And by the way, they're doing great. We miss them. And they, I would like to think they miss me, but I think they're having too good a time to miss their, their oldest son. I'm glad Dad taught me years ago that we all get to heaven on the same day. And there's no night there. Amen. But my grief, the 
absence of their presence in my life has drawn me right down the road to the St. Luke Cemetery many, many days. And I've just stood there huh, by a graveside. I, I feel like I have to go. That first year, I probably went every day. It's hard not to stop in when you're driving, driving right past it on the way to work. When you're driving right past it on the way home. It's the same grief that you and I have ex you've experienced just like me in the absence of people that you love. I don't know what it is, but I almost, I, can't, I couldn't go by without stopping in. I couldn't go by without getting out. I couldn't go by. I couldn't go by. There's been a few days even. I'd take my lunch and I'd just go down to the graveside and have, have my meal right there. As many days I had lunch with my dad. I, mi I miss that. It'll happen again. We'll have that together again. But that's the anguish that we feel in the grief of death. These ladies felt all of that as they went to the cross. They, that's a feeling we all felt. They wanted to be near the one that had passed away. They needed to talk to him, no doubt. They needed to, uh, to, to, to give them a message or uh, maybe give the Lord a message to give to them. I, I realized it myself as I stood at the graveside of my parents, they're probably not listening to me. But if I could tell Jesus something, he could go talk to them and tell them something. So many days I would say, Lord, would you tell mama this? Would you tell daddy this? Would you tell them this? And I'm sure many of us have had that same experience. These ladies felt that same thing as a desire to make sense of why the Messiah was dead and why he left and how he left was so difficult. Their hearts and their minds, again, filled with confusion, filled with concern about their own future. My, if he's dead, what's going to happen to us? If he's gone, what's going to happen to us? And, and, and they were there at the graveside, going to the graveside. Their minds couldn't even think about anything else for the last three days. Yeah. As, they, as, they, as they took their meals, if they were able to eat, if they had their conversations, there was no other subject to speak about but what was going on in their life. Their very best friend, Jesus, was gone. Anguish. Deep anguish. And not only that, some, there was anxiety there. You see that in verse 1. As well as they went, to the, as they went there to the sepulcher, I remind you that the sepulcher of the tomb was guarded by Roman soldiers. Yeah. Not known for their friendliness. Remember, correct? We know how they treated Christ even on the cross. How they treated him before he went to the cross. There was anxiety there. There, was a, there, was a, there were Roman soldiers placed there. There was a huge stone that covered the tomb. They had intended to somehow, uh, again, to, to, uh, to treat his body with, with spices and with perfumes. And how would they gain access to all that? How would they get past the guard? What would they do? Yet they proceeded in anguish and anxiety as they came to the tomb. And thank God, all of that changed when they got there to the tomb. It was, it was now anguish was gone, anxiety was gone, and amazement took over. A great deal of amazement took over as they came to, the, came to the tomb there, and behold, there was a great earthquake. That's pretty shocking, isn't it? That'll get your attention. That'll, that'll shock you out of, the, out, of the, out of your thoughts. And there's a great earthquake. Not only that, now the, the stone is rolled away. Not only that, there's an angel standing there. The whole scene shifts from doom and gloom to amazement as they come to the cross. Their moment of weeping quickly became a moment of wonder as they came within the sight of the tomb. They were astounded to see that huge, heavy stone that was fitted perfectly for that gap in the rock. It was moved away. Now, Roman soldiers that they feared were lying there like dead men. They fainted in disbelief at the overwhelming uh, presence of the angel and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. They run to the tomb. The ladies look in. The body is gone. By the way, they didn't, they, in their first thoughts, they assumed maybe he had been taken. And we even read in this passage, we won't deal with it much this morning, but there was a conspiracy put together to try to convince people that his body had been taken. Amen. In fact, that conspiracy continues even a bit today. They were, they were concerned maybe the Jewish rulers had taken him to prevent his disciples uh, from, from even faking his resurrection. Maybe they suspected that grave robbers had taken Jesus' body and would use it for some, some plot to extort people. I don't know what they thought, but there was a lot of anxiety, there was a lot of anguish, but there was a lot of wonder and amazement. Those doubts and concerns were short-lived as the angel began to speak. The angel of the Lord said, and look, his countenance was like lightning and his raiment white snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became his dead men. The angel answered and said unto the women, fear not ye. Precious words. Don't be afraid. I want you to know they'd spent the last several days overwhelmed by fear. Overwhelmed by the anguish that I just attempted to describe. Overwhelmed by sadness overwhelmed by an uncertainty to the future. And by the way, when we'll listen to the Lord, he knows exactly what we need to hear. He says, do not fear. Amen. Fear ye not. Are you listening to him today? 
Are you listening to the noise of the world? Are you listening to the threats of the devil? Are you listening, listening to the noise of battle that's coming from those who have no love for God? You and I ought to be lending our ear to the sweet voice of Jesus. Amen. Fear not. Fear ye not. As they stood there, they were amazed. The, the angel sees them. He says, fear not, I know you seek Jesus. He was crucified, but he's not here. He is risen. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. It was, it was an amazing thing that goes on. But that amazement didn't end with the words of the angel. It continued with the appearance of Jesus himself. Yeah. How about that? He came to them. He didn't just send a messenger. He showed up personally. Yeah. Thank God for the angel, the messenger of the Lord. But look, Jesus here, as we move down to verse 9, they were given instructions, by the way. We'll speak of in just a moment. Verse 7, go quickly, tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth forth into Galilee there. Ye shall see him. Uh, lo, I have told you. Look in verse 9. And they went, as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them. As they made their way back to town, they encountered the risen Lord. They met him in the way he spoke to them. And thank God for that. I, I wonder this morning if you have any idea that you have met the risen Savior. Have you met the risen Savior? I'm, again, I speak as, as the Bible teaches us, not that we've visibly laid our eyes on him. For our, our risen Savior is at the right hand of the Father. Amen. By the way, if you come back tonight, God willing, in our, in our outdoor service and cookout and our time together, we're going to talk about that risen Savior and that returning Savior. Amen. God willing. But as they, they think about him, they, 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 they encountered him. I wonder, have you encountered that, that Jesus? I want you to know he's been working your entire life to reveal himself to you. That's, that's why God, he created us. That's why he created this world. And he set the world in, in such a way that it testifies of him. We recently heard a wonderful message from our, our dear brother, Evangelist Scott Pauley, on Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night uttereth knowledge. And there's no place where that, that message is not heard, the Bible says. The son, like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. And the great, great son tells us this. There is a God. There is a God. The beauty that you encountered on your drive into this place this morning is telling you, if you'll listen, there is a God. There is a God. And Jesus comes to this earth and tells you not only is there a God, there's a God, but he wants to have a relationship with you. Yeah. He loves you. <laughs> he, wants to, he wants to erase your sin debt. He wants to bring you closer to him. Jesus makes this appearance here in verse 9 as they went to tell the disciples. Jesus met them saying, all hail. And they came and held him by the feet and they worshipped him. It was, just, it was just an amazing thing that, that Jesus appeared and they offered their adoration almost, almost involuntarily. I don't, I don't know if that's the right word. But it was their immediate reaction to fall at the feet of the risen Savior and to realize what he had done and to be so glad and amazed what he's accomplished that they began to adore him and to worship him. That ought to be our reaction. As Jesus reveals himself to us and tells you that he's come to save you from your sin, and he speaks to you in the person of the Holy Spirit, in your spirit, when he speaks those words to you through the power of his word and through the testimony of nature, our job is to fall at his feet and accept him and adore him and worship him. They were overcome with his presence. They worshipped him. They were, in a sense, compelled to worship. The one they, that they sought was before him. The one that they came to minister to now stood before him, alive to minister to them. They had seen his lifeless body, by the way, removed from the cross, and now he stood before them alive. All that he said now, they understood it was true that he would rise from the grave. He, was, he had been dead, and yet now he was alive, and worship was their immediate response. And I tell you what, as we come to a day like today, worship ought to be our response as we consider the resurrected Savior. Worship. But can I tell you this? Worship is only for the redeemed. Only those that have accepted Christ by faith as their personal Savior all enjoy the, enjoy the fact that God loves them. For God so loved the world. But the Lord is seeking those that can worship him in spirit and in truth. God must live in our spirit if we're to worship him in our spirit. And God, Jesus, is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by him. If we are to worship him today, if worship is the res our response to the risen Savior, then we must be a part of the redeemed. Yep. That means we recognize that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We recognize the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're grateful for the fact that God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ went ahead and died for us. 
Before I ever said, I love you to the Lord, he expressed his love to me on the cross. For with the heart, men believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. And the most beautiful words, I think, in the Bible are given in the 13th verse of the 10th chapter of Romans. It says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Aren't you glad there's room for whosoever? Yeah. I, feel like I, I feel like at times in my life I've pushed the boundaries on the whosoever. Because of my own sin and my own wickedness, you know, we look at each other and we're pretty good at being respectable and impressing one another, but we know the wickedness of our hearts. Yeah. We clean up pretty good on Easter Sunday, don't we? Mm-hmm. At least we do as best we can. I try, to, I try to look at the mirror only as long as necessary. It's pretty depressing. We clean up the best we can. But our hearts are wicked. They're desperately wicked, and we need a Savior. He reveals himself to us as the resurrected Savior. Our response ought to be to fall before him, accept that gift, and to worship him. But we shouldn't stop there. We can't stop there because the world awaits the message. And if we read Matthew 28, most often we don't read Matthew, in this church, we don't read Matthew 28 all the time when it comes to the resurrection of the Lord. Most of the time we read it so we can get to verse 18, 19, and 20. Look what it says down there. See, there was not only their anguish that they dealt with as they went to the grave, there was not only their amazement that they dealt with as they, as they saw the angel and they saw the, heard the Savior, but then there was a clear assignment given to them, a very clear assignment that was given to them. And the word go is mentioned up in verse 7. Look, and go quickly. The angel says, go tell the other, your other friends quickly. While the other people were up, where they, were, they were holed up in the upper room. They were worried and they were scared. Go tell them, I'm, go tell them he's alive. Jesus says there in verse 9, he says to them that you should go tell them and, and let them know I'm alive. Now we get down to verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. And, to all, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. There's a clear assignment. We understand the anguish of death, the anxiety of all the uncertainty. We thank God for the amazement that the risen Savior appears in the lives of these ladies and to us personally as well. But that is not simply to be consumed for our sakes individually. It's to be dis- that message is to be disseminated Amen. to this world, to the ends of the earth. And there is no place to stop. Look, there's a command to depart. Their assignment was depart, to go. There's a command to deliver. Go quickly and tell. Don't do it without delay. We can't twiddle our thumbs. We can't think about this. We can't wait on this. Maybe there's a time for strategizing. There's a time for praying. There's a time for direction. But there's a time to go. There's a time to get to work. There's a time to give the message this morning. I stand before you if you don't know the Lord. I'm going and I'm telling and I'm letting you know that you need Jesus Christ for your Savior. If you don't know him today, it ought to be the day of your salvation. And you're among people who want to encourage you to follow the Lord. And we want to do that. It would be a delight if you would accept Christ as your Savior today. We'll give you an opportunity to do that in a moment. But you don't have to wait on me. But you don't need me. You just need to say yes to Jesus. Amen. But we must take that message everywhere. I'm going and telling this morning. And we should leave here going and telling this world why people are dying. Yeah. At a rate faster than we can imagine, people are leaving this world. While I'm preaching this morning, thousands of people have gone out into eternity. While we're speaking, while we're enjoying life, many people are experiencing death. Shocking and sudden at times. Sometimes the end of a long journey of ill health. But every moment people are stepping out into eternity. We must go. There's an urgent message. We must quickly tell. We must do our work here. We must partner with our friends as they go around the world. We must engage here and abroad because people are dying and people are deceived. There is only one truth and Jesus is that truth. I don't mean to be rude to anyone uh, but Muhammad is still in the grave this morning. Excuse me. Buddha's still in the grave, but Jesus came out alive. Amen. And I don't say that to the shame of anyone who would admire Muhammad or would admire Buddha. I say that to the need of everyone. They must know Jesus Christ as their Savior. And you say, that message offends me. I'm sorry it offends you, but it would be worse if I knew the truth and didn't share it with you. Amen. There would be much more discrimination involved in me not telling you the truth than in me pointing you to the right place, to the right person, excuse me. Much more hate 
involved in not telling than in telling. Church, you remember that. I'm not asking your pastor to remember that. When I'm in a situation where people have another, some other spiritual religious belief, I'm not doing them a disservice by pointing them to Jesus. It may, it, may, it may cause my earthly relationships to be strained at times. By the way, I shouldn't do anything to make that harder with my attitude and actions. There should be a humility and a sincerity, but it would be rude and awful and, and absolutely the most wicked thing ever for me to know the truth and not go and tell. See, that, that anguish it turns to amazement, then it turns to an assignment. People are deceived. They've been blinded by Satan. And I want you to know, too, don't you, don't you realize that people are despondent? They're without hope in this world. You ever met somebody who just didn't have a hope? They're hid behind locked doors in fear. They're, they're, they're despondent, just like these disciples were when Jesus, after Jesus died on, on Mount Calvary. The message needs to be shared with people that Christ is alive and we can have new life in him. And the gospel is a message that brings hope to all who will hear it and who will receive it. We must go and tell that is our our assignment because of the resurrected Savior. In verse 6, I love the words that the angel said, come see. Have you come to see the tomb is empty? Spiritually, has, has, has the Holy Spirit to speak, has spoken to you about that? To see is not just to see it with your eyes, but it's to know. To have that confirmed in your heart. I read a survey that said nearly 80% of Americans say they believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I don't know if 80% of Americans know him as their Savior. I, I want that to be true. I don't want to have to doubt it. I have a feeling our country would be a very different place if that were true. But I want you to know this. If you don't know the Lord, he wants to know you. We live in an age of so much knowledge and so advancing technology as it just replicates itself over and over and over. But I found this quote in 1948. General Omar Bradley, a great soldier, great general in World War II, said, We have grasped the mystery of the atom and rejected the Sermon on the Mount. With the monstrous weapons man already has, humanity is in danger of being trapped in this world by moral adolescence. Our knowledge of science has already outstripped our capacity to control control it. We have too many men of science, too few of God. And God help us not just to have a head knowledge, but a heart knowledge of of the risen Savior. Come see. Get to know him. He wants to know you. We've accumulated so much and we've advanced so much, but we must... Ask, have we met the risen Savior? Have we invited him to live inside of you and to deliver you from the spiritual death that you are doomed to without his help? See, you're already born under condemnation. But the risen Savior presents the opportunity for you and I to be delivered from our sin and to be delivered from a Christless eternity in an awful, terrible place called hell that was created for the devil and his angels, I mind you but will be our home for eternity if we do not accept the Savior. And in this hour, I would encourage you on this Easter Sunday, make the risen Savior your Lord. Come see. Know him. Allow him to have his rightful place in your heart. You you may say, like I would think, well, that means a lot of things are going to change. You know what? Jesus is in the business of changing things for us. Don't, Don't try to fix yourself up. You'll do a pretty good job. Let, let Jesus get involved in that with you Amen. by accepting him as your Savior. You don't have to meet any opinion that I have or this church has or any other church person has anywhere else. You only have to come to Jesus Amen. and let him make you the Christian that he will save you to be. Amen. Have you met the risen Savior today? He stands with nail-pierced hands wide open to you and says, I love you. I'm here to save you. Will you receive me? I want you to know he is not here. Thank God he is risen. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this truth, and I ask it in this moment that people would accept you as their Savior if they don't know you, and that we as believers would take this truth and get it to the ends of the earth. (coughs) We've been given an assignment. In this moment, Lord, my assignment is to preach the gospel. And I thank you for all that are here. There may be someone that's here for the first time or maybe some folks that have been here for a long time. There's no doubt we've seen that happen many times in this church. We've had people attend for years without really knowing the Savior. I pray whoever's here today under the sound of my voice in this room or in the overflow or they're 
watching by live stream, that all would know that they've accepted Christ as their Savior. We recognize we're a sinner, and we on purpose pray and ask Jesus into our heart. This morning, if you know uh, that you need the Savior, if you know, Pastor, you've been preaching and talking about Jesus living in your heart, and I've never actually prayed and asked him in, not in a meaningful way, not in a sincere way, Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I will not embarrass you. I only want to help you. But this morning, if you know you need to be saved, you need to pray and ask Jesus into your heart. You need to give yourself to the resurrected Savior because he's given himself for you. If you know you need that, would you be willing to raise your hand in this hour just while I'm looking around, just me and you? Say, I need to ask Christ into my heart this morning. I'm not sure that I'm saved. Do you know that you know? And Christ's spirit will give you that, that assurance. God's word will give you that assurance. And believers, how many of us know that we need to take this message and get it to the world? How, how appropriate on a week when we begin our world mission conference that we would connect the resurrection to evangelism. We connect the resurrection to reaching the lost. How many of you are like me this morning saying, God's speaking to my heart about being a better witness and about doing more to reach the world with the gospel. If that's you, would you be willing to raise your hand this morning? Hands are going up all over the room. Thank God for that. Let's stand together if we would, please. In this time of invitation, they'll begin to play a 